Welcome to Sea Lies online conference. My name is Johanna Lava Kötlum and I'm the CEO of Fiskealink, your host for this conference and your host for the upcoming International Sea Lies conference in Torshavn, Faroe Islands. The last Sea Lies conference was in Chile back in 2018. You, the international Sea Lies community, has been waiting for an opportunity to present and discuss science issues pertaining to sea lice. You may think of this conference, this online conference here, as a forerunner to the conference in May 2022. But I think that our program from today to Thursday presents a good range of interesting and highly relevant topics. Today we bring together around 700 individual registrations for this conference. We have research scientists and farming managers, industry CEO and students, marketing managers and university professors and many, many more. I welcome you all and I hope you'll find the presentations and the online interaction both stimulating and useful in your own work. I hope that you will find a good appetite for participating the, uh, in the 13th International Sea Lice Conference, which will take place here in Toshan, Faroe Islands, in May 2022. Please see the website for registration, submission of abstract, and so on. Before we begin our conference today, I'm very pleased to introduce the Faroe Minister for Environment, Aquaculture, and Industry and Trade, Magnus Rasmussen. Welcome to the first Sea Lies online conference. I know that the 13th International Sea Lies conference was supposed to be here in Toshan in September 2020. We all know why this didn't happen. But as one door shuts, another usually opens. The Sea Lies online conference today represents this open door. I'm very pleased to see how Fiske Erling and the organizing committee have dedicated efforts to bring the international sea lice community back together again. I believe that we cannot underestimate the importance of putting results and data from international sea lice research to good use. In fact, this is important from several different perspectives science, industry, authorities, and society at large. It is a win-win situation. In the Faroe Islands, we are privileged to have God-given natural conditions for fish farming. Our islands are surrounded by pristine waters, the temperature is very favorable, and the ocean around our islands is naturally feeding habitat for salmon. Aquaculture in the Faroe Islands goes back to the 60s and with Fiske Erling established in 1970, we started to see an unstoppable drive to improve the basic conditions and methods for fish farming. We quickly realized that good fish welfare is a prerequisite for successful farming and for production in general. Over the last 30 years or so, we have made amazing progress in many different fields of salmon farming, as have other salmon producing countries. Building on the work of the original pioneers, we depend upon the important research progress made by academic, government and industry-based scientists. This progress helps us both to manage and control sea lice, while at the same time improving fish welfare and minimizing adverse environmental impacts. Most important, however, is the commitment of the industry to implement the new knowledge generated, because it makes good sense, which at the end of the day all leads to profitable results. This conference is instrumental in generating better understanding of sea lice, the biology and their environment. 
and how fish welfare may be incrementally improved to allow them to further thrive in aquaculture conditions. While I welcome the Sea Lights online conference, I will also mention the 13th International Sea Lights Conference, which will be in Taoshan next year in May. You are all invited, so I hope that many of you decide to visit these beautiful islands and participate in the 2022 conference. In conclusion, I wish you the best of luck with the Sea Lights online conference, and I hope you will all take away many interesting points and findings that you can use in your continued research work. Welcome to you all. Thank you. I will now take the opportunity to tell you a little about our research institute, Fiskalink, also called Aquaculture Research Station of the Pharaohs. A great poet once wrote, Far out in the mercury shining ocean lies a lonely little lead colored land. The tiny rocky land relates to the great sea much like a grain of salt on the floor of a ballroom. But viewed under a magnifying glass, this grain of salt is still a whole world with mountains and valleys, sound and fjords and houses with small people. So please watch and listen to this short video presentation we made for you. For 50 years, we've been focused on sustainable aquaculture. Incorporated in 1970, Fiskaling laid the foundation for modern Faroese aquaculture. Today, 30 employees produce cutting-edge research on aquaculture-related issues. Our founders pioneered fish farming on the Faroe Islands. They believed that innovation and cooperation is the key to success. Learning by doing, always rising to overcome new challenges, that spirit has remained with us. Now, Fiskailing is a government-owned institute, which secures a solid financial base for our operations. Our research projects are grant-funded, and we have strong local and international partnerships. Fiskailing collects valuable data for both practical and academic purposes. This makes our researchers in high demand as project partners and conference presenters. Our expertise is also a sought-after resource by the aquaculture industry. In our laboratory, we work with molecular analyses, identification of harmful algae, plantonic sea lice, and more. Fiske Ailing provides independent sea lice counts in every salmon farm cage in the Faroe Islands. Our coastal research contributes to assessing the biotic and abiotic status of the fjord environment. Environmental management and fish welfare are at the heart of our operations. Our work helps improve industry standards and contributes to reaching the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We believe that if our fjords and farmed fish are doing well, then we're doing well as a nation. It is our duty to preserve our ocean's resources for future generations. Most important, however, is the aquaculture industry's commitment to implement the knowledge we generate, because producing an environmentally sustainable, high-quality product translates to good business. So you may ask, what really drives us at Fiske Ailing? To mention but a few, maintaining the Faroe Islands as world leaders in visionary aquaculture, understanding ocean and fjord dynamics and biology, nature, the people, and food production are all connected. 
hence the Fiskealing vision, knowledge for sustainable aquaculture. Thank you for watching. Uh, your host today are here in the studio. Welcome. Uh, we have uh, Ian Salter, researcher, researcher scientist from the uh, Marine uh, Ferro Marine Research Institute, and Oasa Johannesen, researcher at Fiskaling. So I will leave this conference in their very capable hands. My main interests are fish welfare, fish behaviour and exposed farming. I have a PhD in behavioural ecology from the University of Leeds in the UK. Yep, and my name's Ian Salter. I'm a scientist at the Faroese Marine Research Institute. Um, my main fields of interest are plankton ecology and their links with um, biogeochemical fluxes. And I obtained my PhD in chemical oceanography at the National Oceanography Center in Southampton in the United Kingdom. Um, now, before we proceed to the uh, presentations themselves, there are just a few practical considerations that we would like to draw your attention to. Um, so during the conference, um, most of the presentations will have been pre-recorded, but there are some that will be streamed live. Now, regardless of the mode of transmission, you'll have the opportunity to, uh, to contribute um, to, to both types of presentations. So while the presentations themselves are ongoing, um, you can ask a question or, or make a comment um, during the presentations themselves, rather than waiting until the uh, question and answer session at the end. And you'll have the opportunity to write your questions and comments in, um, in the text box on the right of your screen. And we would encourage you to do that because our editing team will then post the comments directly on the screen so they're visible for all participants. And then each participant will also have the opportunity to, to vote um, by, by clicking on the thumbs up icon. Uh, and this will allow us to see which questions uh, are considered the most pertinent by the audience. And then we'll try to focus on these questions and comments during the question and answer session at the end. Awesome. Um, secondly, uh, we would like to know about uh, what you think about this conference. Um, you will see a button in the top right corner of your screen that's called polls. Um, if you click that before you leave us after the conference, uh, a, you will be taken um, to uh, a questionnaire. It's a very short questionnaire, um, but uh, it would be really good for us if you would uh, fill it in for us because it's important to us to know what you think, uh, both about the conference, topics um, and the presentations and also just this kind of format the conference format that we're using today so um, thank you very much for your cooperation on that um, we have a change in our program today uh, due to unforeseen events dr christian gallardo escarate uh, unfortunately had to cancel his presentation today um, this means that the presentation named Omics, New Keys for Understanding and Controlling Sea Lice, is no longer part of the program today. Um, we do apologize for this. Um, to compensate, we aim to invest some extra time into the Q&A. Uh, so please um, give us lots of questions uh, so that after the uh, fourth presenter, we will um, be able to have a really good and uh, long discussion. I believe there might be a delay in our program. Hopefully, uh, we'll be able to start soon. Yeah, uh, actually, our first presenter was um, intended to join us live uh, through Zoom, but um, yeah, it seems that there are some technical difficulties at the moment, so we're going to advance to um, one of the pre-recorded presentations. Um, so I'll pass over to Arsa to introduce the speaker. Yes. Um, so um, the first presentation today will uh, be uh, about parasite evolution in response to treatment pressures, drug resistance and others. 
The talk is from Dr. Armin Sturm, Senior Lecturer at the Institute of Aquaculture, uh, Faculty of Natural Sciences at the University of Stirling in Scotland. Dr. Sturm's interests include the control of sea lice, biochemical mechanisms of toxicity, and the molecular mechanisms of sea lice resistance against treatments. Take it away, Dr. Sturm. Good afternoon. My name is Armin Sturm, and the title of my talk is Parasite Evolution in Response to Treatment Pressures, Drug Resistance. The control of sea lice has relied until recently widely on the use of chemicals. However, resistance development has made uh, most such treatments ineffective. In this talk, I would like to review what is currently known about the mechanisms of uh, drug resistance development in sea lice in order to contribute to the development of treatment strategies that uh, preserve remaining efficacies. Uh, I further hope that some of the thoughts covered uh, will be useful for the design of strategies using non-chemical approaches. However, for time reasons, I will not be able to cover uh, non-chemical approaches in this presentation. Pesticide resistance is the result of an evolutionary process where we have continuous selection uh, with one chemical or several chemicals sharing the same mode of action. And uh, something that happens then is that rare alleles become enriched, which are uh, associated with a lower susceptibility to the compounds in question. And if this carries on for long enough, we end up with a resistant population of the pest. This uh, slide shows the timeline of when chemical delousing treatments were introduced in salmon uh, producing uh, areas of the North Atlantic. Um, and you can see that in the top half of the slide, uh, whereas the bottom half of the slide uh, provides the timeline of reports of resistance against uh, the different treatments. And if we take into account that there will be a certain delay between the development of resistance in the field and um, the, its account in the scientific literature, it seems that uh, it takes about five to, to seven years after the introduction of a treatment to uh, for resistance to appear. So illustrating that uh, the salmon loss has a considerable capacity to develop uh, drug resistance. And uh, in the next slides, we shall uh, analyze factors that contribute to this high capacity. We saw in an earlier slide that the evolution of resistance is based on rare uh, genetic variants or mutations, and the likelihood for these to be present in a population is proportionate to population size. In addition, uh, each reproduction event will potentially produce new uh, mutations. Therefore, population size and generation time are relevant here, and they are both um, favorable in, in the salmon laws. In addition, the salmon laws has also a high potential for dispersal so that uh, resistance, once it has evolved locally, can spread geographically. Another factor that uh, helps explain why arthropods can develop uh, pesticide resistance uh, comparatively quickly is uh, related to the molecular mechanisms at play. Here we distinguish target site resistance as one of the main mechanisms. Uh, and here a, a mutation leads to the change of, of an amino acid or several amino acids in, in a target site uh, protein. Uh, and this disrupts the action of the, the pesticide. Whereas in metabolic resistance, uh, a, a mutation leads to the enhanced expression of an enzyme involved in the detoxification of the compound in question, uh, also leading to resistance. So please note that in, in both cases, then it just needs to be one mutation in one gene uh, in order to produce resistance. And this is another uh, explanation why arthropods can develop pesticide resistance relatively quickly. This slide reviews what is currently known about drug resistance mechanisms in the salmon laws. As we saw before, there are four types of treatments affected by resistance development. Uh, in the North Atlantic, and different studies contributed to understanding the mechanisms. So the mechanism ha has been fully resolved for the first compound, azametiphos, where a point mutation in the gene coding for acetylcholinesterase is responsible for the resistance. For the other compounds listed here, uh, there are still gaps in our understanding of the uh, mechanisms, and I won't go into the details, but the available data are in harmony with the hypothesis that one resistance gene or perhaps a few resistance genes are uh, responsible per compound class, uh, meaning that what we said in the previous slide 
few mutations are required to achieve resistance holds true for the Salmon laws, uh, explaining its high potential for resistance formation. Another relevant question is whether there are any fitness costs associated to resistance if there is no pesticide exposure. For instance, uh, target site mutations may protect um, the target site from the pesticide, but may also uh, lead it to uh, be compromised in its natural functions. And the upregulation of detoxification enzymes in metabolic resistance may be associated to physiological costs to produce these uh, enzymes. In terrestrial arthropods, uh, only some studies have found uh, evidence for fitness costs, whereas other studies have uh, failed to de detect any fitness costs of uh, resistance phenotypes. In salmon lice, there has been uh, one study looking at amamectin benzoate resistance, and this study did not find evidence for fitness costs of this type of resistance. Something interesting to consider here is the origin of resistance. So if a resistance mutation is associated with a fitness cost, we expect it to be very rare before the selection with the pesticide. Once the pesticide um, becomes introduced, it will be a one-off event that such a mutation occurs and uh, resistance development starts from a single point of origin. And therefore, in the resistant population, we would find uh, such mutations being typically associated with just a single haplotype. In contrast, if we look at a mutation that is not carrying a fitness cost, then we would expect it to um, be already present before the pesticide is used and therefore being associated with multiple haplotypes. And after resistance development, we would be still uh, be able to detect that uh, by having the mutation being associated to multiple haplotypes. And if we look at results of studies in sea lice, we find that uh, the acetyl conine esterase mutation associated to organophosphate resistance uh, actually occurs in multiple haplotypes, suggesting it is not associated with fitness costs, whereas the uh, mutations associated with uh, amamectin benzoate resistance and delta methrin resistance each uh, are associated with a single haplotype that has spread, suggesting that these might be potentially uh, associated to fitness costs. Something else to consider in sea loss resistance development is whether there are uh, any wild host available uh, because these will not be subjected to treatments. Uh, therefore, wild host populations provide a refu refuge where there's no selection for resistance genes and therefore wild type genotypes are conserved. So modeling studies in sea lice support the importance of wild hosts as refuges and um, suggest that the differences in the relative speed of resistance development is uh, linked to uh, the relative size of wild host and farmed host populations. A key question in pest management is how to best combine the similar treatments, meaning pesticides of different modes of action, to delay the evolution of resistance. So uh, among the strategies proposed in this regard, response alternation uh, involves use of a first compound until resistance evolves and then switches to the next compound, whereas periodic application alternates between um, at least two compounds on a temporal scale, switching, rotating between them. Uh, mosaic is a strategy that is similar to periodic application, but here the uh, use of the compounds is not uh, alternated on a temporal but a spatial scale. And finally, combination means that every treatment uh, combines at least two compounds uh, simultaneously. And um, this systematic review paper by uh, Bogue, um looked at studies uh, that compared these strategies, and they found that the best strategy across all reviewed studies was combination, and the worst strategy was response alternation. In sea lice, uh, this topic has been uh, addressed by a modeling study by, by McEwen and um, co-workers. And here, uh, combination was the best strategy, but the remaining strategies were similar in uh, efficacy. It depended very much on the uh, conditions. Um, so it might be interesting to expand this uh, approach to other scenarios because it depends very much on the assumptions you make about how treatments are combined. To conclude, the design of optimal long-term 
resistance management strategies will benefit from a better understanding of the evolution of resistance, particularly with regards to the fitness costs associated with resistance, the roles of wild hosts as refuges, and the relative performance of alternative strategies to combine treatments. With this, I'm at the end of this talk. I would like to uh, acknowledge the funders of my research um, in the past years, and I would like to thank you for your attention and open this talk for questions. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sturm. Um, and I'm delighted to, uh, to inform you that the uh, technical issues have been resolved so we can proceed with the program. Uh, and we continue with the topic one, which is host and parasite uh, biology keys for control. And the next presenter will now be uh, Professor Ian Bricknell, who will be speaking about how not to get infected, a salmon eyes view. Dr. Bricknell comes from North London in the United Kingdom. In 1983, he went to university to study zoology and geology at the University of Reading, graduating with a first class honors from there in 1986. Following that, Dr. Bricknell moved to Lancaster University to read for his PhD. And in 1991, he was awarded the Modern Geology Young Geologist of the Year Award. In 2007, Dr. Bricknell accepted the post of Libra Professor of Aquaculture Biology at the University of Maine. And in 2009, was appointed as the first director of the Aquaculture Research Institute. Since arriving in the USA, he has established a new aquatic animal disease research group. And he, is, he has expanded his research interests to include lobster health, and he is committed to helping the working waterfront in Maine to ensure a sustainable and dynamic aquaculture industry in Maine. He works on the developmental immunity of larval fishes and with host pathogen interactions. His interests include the interaction of parasites with their host and the mechanisms they employ to avoid the host's defense mechanisms immunological detection of fish disease and the development of the immune system of larval fishes and the onset of immunocompetence and the mechanisms that larval fish use to contain or resist infection. So we're delighted to be able to welcome um, Dr. Bricknell, who is here with us live. So please, Dr. Bricknell, the floor is yours. Yeah, that's okay. 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 Well, good morning, everybody, and um, thank you for um, inviting me to uh, give this talk on um, not getting lice, the salmon the eyes view. And I'm planning to give you all a, a review, um, really, of the history of how we've tried to stop sea lice uh, settling on salmon uh, since aquaculture started um, in the, uh, the oceans. Uh, back in the uh, 1970s. So um, this is my uh, introduction. How not to get lice. This is the salmon's eye view. So salmon lice, as we know, are considered to be one of the uh, major limits uh, of uh, salmon farming today, especially economically. And the estimates vary, but the costs are over $1 billion uh, in lost production and treatments to control sea lice. And all of the major salmon farming areas today have sea lice issues. That's, of course, Europe, North America, the North Pacific, and Chile, where the dominant um, sea lice there is Calicus roger cressii. And even Australia has reported the salmon lice uh, on their Atlantic salmon farms back in 2011. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on. So how do we avoid lice? And, and, and since the 1970s, we've stopped lice or try to stop lice by several different ways we try to isolate the farms we tried locations where sea lice don't do very well of course we've used medications we're looking at engineering solutions we look at immunology and, and functional feeds and we try to breed resistance uh, into those uh, animals that we're trying to farm so let's look uh, at isolation so we attempted to uh, move salmon farms offshore. This has been a, a big movement over the years, never really successfully. And that provides a lot of issues with uh, engineering solutions for the higher environments. 
And then we've tried to develop enclosed marine systems where we get the benefits of open ocean, uh, open ocean farming, where um, we get uh, the large volumes of water, the, the optimum temperatures for salmon production, but we uh, also have those problems uh, that we also have the higher energy costs uh, uh, for um, filtering those water volumes going through the cages. And of course, we've developed onshore systems um, for Atlantic salmon, which are becoming more common. Um, these recirculating systems on land seem to be taking off widely, and um, they're allowing Atlantic salmon to be grown out of range, e.g. Atlantic sapphire, uh, that's growing salmon in Florida much closer uh, to the uh, markets uh, down south than, say, um, Atlantic salmon that are grown in Maine. Now, isolation uh, of um, uh, farming regions has the potential to be very successful. The concept is to move salmon to areas of the ocean where lice don't live, and then moving uh, farms to areas where lice themselves are very rare. And of course, the other option is to move farms uh, to areas that are incompatible with sea lice physiology. So let's look at some of those solutions. Well, the potential to control sea lice by isolation, uh, at least hypothetically, has a lot of potentials. One of those was to move salmon to the southern hemisphere. There are no native uh, salmonids in, in the uh, southern hemisphere. And uh, Chile introduced a lot of wild-run salmon for sports fishery over 100 years ago. And there was no real significant report of, of sea lice on these wild runs of salmon in Chile for over 100 years. And people thought, how could it possibly go wrong? We seem to have this area where there's very few uh, parasites. And we also have this area uh, where um, we have good areas for growing Atlantic salmon. But we hadn't considered evolution. Now, back in 1905, there were some reports of Caligus terrarum, Teres uh, uh, appearing on some of these invasive salmonids that have been introduced to sports fisheries, but they may well have been misidentified Caligus rogercresii. But in the 1990s, we saw considerable host switching of Caligus rogercresii from its native host, Elegonopsis and Maclevinus. Um, and that, of course, may very well uh, of, of been due to evolution, and we're seeing the uh, development and the um, appearance uh, of a subspecies of Canada's Roger Crescent that prefers Atlantic salmon uh, compared to um, when compared to uh, its normal host range of Anopsis and Odentithesis. Even Australia, which is as, probably as far away as you can get. Uh, from the uh, native salmon natural range uh, has developed uh, uh, a few reports of uh, sea lice on the farm salmon there. <clears throat> and in particular, Caligus longirostris uh, was uh, reported by Barbara Norak back in 2011. And this suggests, at least to me, that copods seem to be incredibly good at exploiting these new resources and possibly evolving rapidly uh, into these new niches that aquaculture has provided. Well, isolation has sort of worked, but the problem is that being that rapid development uh, of other species to fill the niche of an egg parasite of salmon. And these parasites have brought similar problems compared to the European situation uh, where a, a sea lice and Atlantic salmon first developed those uh, 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 issues. And of course, as we hear, location is everything. Can we move fish farms from areas where sea lice are common? To where they're, they're rare. Well, of course, that's one of the options that you can do to move fish farms offshore, and, and that's being considered. And can you inf avoid farmed and wild interactions by moving uh, fish farms away from wild fish runs? There are some limitations of that concept of, <coughs> of location. First thing you need to know where the lice are, and that's often best done by sentinel studies, which are expensive to do and require a long-term study to work out when lice are at the peak. Low salinity habitats would be ideal um, to, make, to, to locate salmon farms, and there are a few out there uh, which do very well from the point of view of 
having low sea life settlement, but they're often in association or close to estuaries where wild salmon runs go through, and that's not ideal for avoiding those interactions. And as I said earlier, <clears throat> moving offshore potentially may reduce exposure to sea lice numbers, but that, those studies haven't been done yet. We don't know what the infectious pressure of sea lice in offshore locations is, and that's something that needs to be studied before uh, offshore fish farming um, can be guaranteed to be sea lice free. <clears throat> medications is an interesting story. Medications were the standard uh, method of treatment from the 1990s, certainly until the early 2010s. And we went through a whole range of, of, of medications, such as organic phosphates, cuticular inhibitors, pyrethroids, hydrogen peroxides, <clears throat> and in-feed iron channel inhibitors. And they all worked very well initially, but they all developed problems subsequently. And of course, not least uh, is the way medications were used in the environment in the 70s and 80s, where we tended to add the uh, medication to the pen containing the sea lice infected fish. And we often <clears throat> release that water containing the active drug into the ocean to dilute it away. This would have an effect on the um, other sensitive organs, uh, organisms that are in the vicinity of the fish farm. Also, it would provide <clears throat> suboptimal uh, dosing of any wild sea lice out there and cause selective pressures and local uh, damage to the plankton population. So <clears throat> we went on to develop on, uh, on ship type treatments for these uh, medications where the fish are pumped on shore, treated on board a, a boat, uh, and then uh, any effluent is either bought on land for appropriate disposal or purified, checked with high pressure liquid chromatography before being discharged into the environment drug free. And of course, the other one is drug resistance. Arthropods and sea lice are no exception to this have a huge ability to develop drug resistance. In some uh, insects, <clears throat> drug resistance to emamectin benzoate occurred within two seasons. Fortunately for sea lice, it took around a, a decade, but these uh, group of drugs, emamectin benzoate and ivermectin, work um, by inhibiting the glutamine and glutamine chloride channels in nerve cells. It's a single amino acid, uh, um, um, single amino mutation, uh, at the binding site of the drug that prevents the uh, drug uh, being uh, efficacious and inhibiting those channels, channel, those ion channels. So this gives us the ability for the sea lice to select for that gene with a single mutation, and that would effectively <clears throat> reduce the uh, efficaciousness of that uh, class of drugs. And that's what happened. We really moved away from just a, a major drug treatment to control sea lice. Now, we've also developed a lot of engineering solutions. Sea lice have some unique biophysical characteristics. They struggle to infect uh, fish below four meters in depth. And can this be exploited to lower infectious pressures? They're also uh, temperature and freshwater intolerant. <clears throat> but one of the things that's interesting about the four meter in depth uh, issue Initially, people started to feed the fish below four meters and noticed that this reduced the lice numbers. And this led to the development of this structure, which is the snorkel cage. The snorkel cage is effectively a, a, a cage that uh, the top 10 meters is um, a tube suspended below the cage that has a material that prevents sea lice entering the, the water around it. The water flows around that area. And then below that, we have a normal uh, fish farm um, net pen where the fish spend most of their time coming up to the surface where they can be fed and <clears throat> they can be health inspected and of course they can fill their swim bladders and some of these systems have been very effective they've reduced uh, sea lice numbers by up to 80 percent but there are some engineering limitations they cannot be used in shallow water situations where aquaculture occurs like the region i'm working in now the gulf of maine where uh, we are less than uh, 30 meters, typical ocean depth. And that top section that excludes the sea lice significantly increases drag on the moorings. So you have to be prepared to change your engineering, which has additional costs. 
Thermolysis and hydrolysis are a relatively new approach. What happens is the fish are removed from the uh, pen. The cold water from the cage is removed. The fish are passed through warm water <clears throat> that's above the thermal limit for the lice, but below the threshold for the damage of the fish. They're then dewatered again and returned to the pen while that water is filtered to remove the lice, reheated and returned <clears throat> back into the treatment area. And of course, this can be combined or used separately with fresh water or pressurized marine water to wash the lice off the fish. And of course, some systems <clears throat> will use a combination of both of these methods. Now, my interest in this has been immunology, and for the last five minutes or so of this talk, I want to talk about um, vaccines and vaccines against adult sea lice, vaccines against the calamus stages. I'll mention immunostimulants very quickly, where they can help regulate the immune response of salmon to prevent <clears throat> initial settlement. And these uh, in feeds have been uh, effective, at least partly, in reducing settlement at the calamus stages. But really, what we want is to induce the uh, strong immune response we see in um, Pacific salmon, as you can see in the background from Johnson Albright's key paper, where we see this massive immune response in those top illustrations with a large amount of neutrophils, effectively engulfing the attached stages of the parasite and killing them. While below, we can see the attached stages of a <coughs> Lepioptera salmonis on Atlantic salmon. And we see that most of that uh, immune response is lacking. And that suggests very much that some active immune modulation going on there between the parasite and the host. Well, as you know, um, I've said this many times, you can vaccinate antelope against lions and you can get an excellent antibody response in the blood of the antelope. But it doesn't stop lions from hunting them. They don't know they've been vaccinated. So the lions will uh, meet the antelope in a not very friendly way. And then the uh, uh, lion will continue to eat the antelope, which will get the antibodies into the lion. But by then, it's too late for the antelope. The antelope is dead. And that's exactly the same model that happens with adult sea lice vaccines. You can vaccinate salmon against adult sea lice and get very, very good antibody titers against proteins in their digestive tract. Well, unfortunately, salmon lice don't recognize this. They settle on the skin of the salmon. And by the time you breach the integument and they're feeding on a reasonable amount of blood, you have these large lesions on the salmon. So that model is one of the issues why I think that sea lice vaccines against adults, especially against Lepioptera salmonis, have never been particularly effective because we're not seeing a true blood feeder as we are in ticks, for example. And my group has had a lot of interest in the uh, interaction of the calamus stages uh, and how they work um, uh, with the immune system of the salmon. And normally we see very little um, inflammation at the attachment site, uh, and those uh, lice go on to develop into the adults. We've been trialing a, a, a lot of potential uh, vaccines um, uh, against some of the proteins that are produced by the calamus stages. And we followed a pattern in 2019 where we showed significant uh, reduction of 33 and 31%, respectively, against settlement uh, of sea lice in Atlantic salmon. And we'd also, um, as you can see here, uh, introduced an inflammatory response on those settlement sites compared to one here, uh, where we have the calamus stage still attached to the fish. So looking at this host parasite interaction seems to be paying some benefits in understanding the immune modulation of the host by the parasite. Functional feeds are also another way we can stop sea lice uh, getting um, lice. And there are four basic concepts. First one is the push response, where the semi-chemical is repellent to lice <clears throat> and pushes uh, salmon lice away from the salmon themselves. The second one is a chemical that a semi-chemical that pulls salmon and attractant, that pulls salmon towards um, a, a, a chemical signal 
and that's effectively pulling the salmon towards traps, for example. You can mask the smell of, of salmon by semiochemicals that hide salmon from the light. And then finally, you can use feeds of improved wound healing to allow lice to recover uh, from lice, uh, sorry, salmon to recover more rapidly from lice damage. You can also breed resistance. We're very lucky here. We have the National Center for Cold Water Aquaculture in Maine, who have a long breeding program uh, for um, breeding resistance to and improving uh, lines of fish. And as you can see in this study by Peterson et al., we have the uh, sensitive families on the right, and they have approximately four times the sea lice as the resistant families on the left. So we can see that we do have potential to include uh, lice resistance in the genome of Atlantic salmon by selective breeding. But there is no magic bullet to this. Um, we don't have a single solution towards sea lice management within uh, fish farms. We really need to use an integrated pest management system for sea lice. So, for example, a successful low uh, lice salmon farm of the future may use engineering solutions, clean the fish, vaccine, functional feeds, etc., to keep those levels low and the fish healthy. So, with that, I want to say thank you for listening to me for the last 10 minutes or so. I want to see you all in uh, the Faroe Islands next year. And I do have to thank a few people who have helped me over the years. The organizing committee uh, who invited me to give this talk, Jim Treasurer, James Braun, Jessica Pease, Sarah Barker, Debbie Bouchard, Stuart Johnson, Mark Fast, Mike Petrak, all the people in my lab who have helped me over the years in, in, in my uh, interest in sea lice. My uh, industrial collaborators, Cook Aquaculture, uh, Benchmark Animal Health, and funding agencies like the USDA, uh, the ARI at UMaine, um, the National Science Foundation, the National Re uh, Northeast Regional Aquaculture Centre, etc. And of course, last but not least, Lepioptera Salmonis, who's paid my mortgage for many years. So with that, I'd like to thank you for listening to me, and uh, I'll be back for the, um, briefly at least, for the um, uh, panel in uh, when that starts, but I jump, fortunately, in about an hour and 15 minutes. Thank you very much and uh, goodbye. Excellent. Thank you very much, Professor Bricknell, for that uh, very interesting and informative presentation. Um, I'd just like to remind you that um, yeah, we welcome you to submit your questions and comments. Um, and if you could also include the name of the presenter to which they are intended, that would help us um, kind of uh, regulate that towards the end. In, in some cases, it's clear. Um, so our next presenter is from Canada, and we'll be talking about um, host immunity and host subversion by sea lice. And that's uh, Dr. Laura Braden, who is currently the program lead for fish health and molecular biology at Aquabounty Canada. Um, she has worked with aquaculture since 2009, um, whilst uh, studying in graduate school at the University of Victoria on Vancouver Island. And her doctoral research focused on the immunological response of salmon to sea lice infections. Following the completion of her PhD, uh, Laura was recruited for a Dr. Braden. Sorry, was recruited for a postdoctoral position at the Atlantic Veterinary College, the University of uh, Prince Edward Island, where she continued studying aquatic animal health, including resistance to sea lice. So I'd now like to offer the floor up uh, for Laura's. Um, pre-recorded presentation. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Laura Brayden. I'm the program lead, Fish Health and Molecular Biology with Aquabounty Canada. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about host immunity and subversion in the salmon-louse-salmon -salmon relationship. I'm super pleased to have this opportunity. It's been a while since I've had the opportunity to talk about sea lice. And I know that my time is limited. So within 10 minutes or so, I'm just gonna give you a brief overview and an update on the work myself and others are doing with respect to the host parasite relationship. So without further ado, I will start my presentation. The relationship between host and pathogen is incredibly complex and dynamic across time and space. 
and is a result of millions of years of co-evolutionary arms races. Responses by both parties are critical for determining disease. And so a holistic system-wide approach is fundamental if we're to understand the mechanisms at play. And that is certainly the case for Lepiopteria salmonis, the salmon louse. Post-parasite relationships can be bucketed into three main categories. The outcomes of the first one is susceptibility, where the host recognition is evaded by the parasite. There's a negative impact on fitness, and this is where we typically see severe pathology or, or cases of accumulation of infection. The, the second bucket or outcome is the resistance. And this is where the host outcompetes the parasite. The host is able to recognize, neutralize, and reject the parasite. And finally is tolerance. And this is where there's a mutual relationship. The, to the host is tolerating infestation. There's limited pathology, not really any measurable impact on host fitness. Um, and those three, but those three different outcomes are typically not distinct. And there's this spectrum across any given population of hosts, whereby you have the very susceptible individuals in the given population, the very resistant, and then a majority of the population is somewhat tolerant to infection. With respect to salmon, lice, and salmon, the skin attachment site is the primary interface, and this is where the magic happens, so to speak. There is a parasite attack response uh, that changes over developmental time. The mechanical damage that's associated with feeding and attachment that, as I mentioned, changes over time. And the bioactive secretome um, that is delivering, secreting or excreting um, molecules that are immunomodulatory and impact certain pathways in the host physiology. And then from the host side of things, there's the initial behavioral response from the, from the salmon as uh, they try and dislodge and prevent infestation. Um, and that is followed by immune recognition and, and immune responses. And of course, the immune responses really depend on the susceptibility status of the host um, from very little recognition um, to an aggressive response that we see in coho salmon. And here I'm showing you um, a picture from a, kind of a seminal paper produced by Ina Overgaard and others in 2016, where they show, kind of validate and confirm the presence of ducks and glands in the salmon louse. And this is just showing the uh, secretory glands in the, la in the labial secretory glands. So really confirming that like ticks, uh, salmon lice do have the ability to secrete or excrete um, molecules, compounds, and this kind of pharmacological active slurry um, onto its host that certainly plays a role in the host parasite relationship. There has been a ton of work over the last several years uh, trying to characterize and profile the host responses of various salmonid species um, to left up there, salmonis. And I don't have the time or the space, unfortunately, to discuss all those studies. However, we did write a review last year that attempts to summarize that current state of literature. So if you, if you would like some more details, please see that review. But basically, the data shows there's this spectrum of susceptibility whereby salmon species such as coho and pink salmon are, are really resistant as juveniles. Um, but Atlantic salmon, uh, sockeye salmon, coho salmon are, are definitely more susceptible. And then we have kind of the, the mid-range species such as Chinook um, that, that don't really succumb to pathology but do harbor intermediate uh, numbers of parasites. And the degree and the timing and the composition of the responses um, do change among these different species. And there are also contrib contributions of life history strategies. And, and one great example of this is pink salmon. And we know they're juvenile. Pink salmon are very resistant, uh, but adults harbor large populations of sea lice. So presumably at some developmental stage, energy is shifted from uh, immunity and, and parasite rejection to fecundity and reproduction. Um, there also appears to be variable intraspecific host responses. This has been leveraged uh, with respect to selective breeding programs to improve Atlantic salmon responses to, to let the up there salmonis. Um, the salmon still succumb to infection. Um, however, they just get less lice but perhaps a, a true resistant phenotype such as, what, such as what we see in pink and coho salmon 
um, would be more desirable where the parasite is literally rejected. And that's what you would see here in, in coho salmon. This is the rejection response that's associated with the frontal filament in Calamus 1. Um, in contrast, here is the response in Atlantic salmon. Obviously, there's chronic wounds and you know, very high abundance of parasites. Um, and then this is a, co an, a picture of a laboratory infection with sockeye salmon showing clear um, de you know, pathology associated with, with lice infestation. In addition to the variable susceptibility we observe among species of salmon, there also appears to be a variable um, approach or strategy within the resistant phenotypes. For example, pink salmon responses appear to really focus on nutritional immunity and hemostasis. Um, and, and this figure, I should say, this figure attempts to summarize all the data that's available for coho, pink, and Atlantic salmon. Again, too many authors um, and not enough time to explain all the data, uh, but it, it would be described in the review that this figure is associated with. But yeah, so pink salmon, um, really the responses indicate nutritional immunity um, and development of scales is what uh, triggers resistance, whereas in coho salmon, cellular responses drive resistance, and the cellular responses and inflammation kind of perpetuates throughout throughout the infection until about four or seven day post infection, um, when you start to see the formation of the granuloma, and and really by 16 days, you know the profile has almost achieved homeostasis. In contrast to both those phenotypes, obviously Atlantic salmon, we don't see that same response, and and um, there is a weak, absent inflammatory response at the attachment site. This results in the chronic wounds and pathology accompanied um, by this phenotype. So what is clear is that we're currently lacking the resolution required to fully characterize these differences among species, and that's largely due to the fact that most studies either focus on one species, um, different time points, different strains of Leptothera uh, salmonis, and, and different lab conditions. Um, so a current initiative is striving to improve our understanding uh, in a large-scale comparative study. So we should have it, some exciting new data out of, um, out of this project in the near future, and I look forward to, to hearing about it from the authors. So with respect to coho salmon, uh, it seems that their response is kind of the magic equation of resistance, if you will. We expose, you know, 20 gram fish to about 75 copepidites per fish, and after about 10 to 16 days post infection, they have largely rejected all the parasites. And this rejection response um, is associated with this encapsulation of the frontal filament and, and the and the entire parasite. Um, if you were to cut through this kind of granuloma on the skin, you would see an embedded parasite in there. So the question is. Uh, why is this happening in coho salmon and, and how are they able to resist um, the impacts that are observed in Atlantic salmon? How are they able to reject the salmon louse? And that leads me into kind of quickly discussing the parasite response because, you know, one of the main questions that still remains to be answered is kind of the chicken or the egg argument is are resistant species um, able to circumvent immunomodulation, or is the parasite not immunomodulating them? Is that you know what is happening, and, and is that contributing to the phenotype of resistance? So the salmon louse attaches to its host with an embedded frontal filament and grazes in the immediate area as calamus one and two. Mobile adults cause the most damage, as I've mentioned before, and penetrate through the mucosa to obtain blood meals, which is known to be important for egg production. Um, it's at this stage uh, where uh, effector molecules, virulence factors, VFs, are thought to play a, a pretty kind of fundamental role in the host parasite relationship. The louse is known to produce many proteins, um, 80 plus proteins that have been characterized and, and, and identified in the secretome. Um, they're, they're facilitating parasitism and driving parasite fitness. And, and this image here shows an in situ uh, hybridization of the, one of the most famous of those proteases, um, trypsin-1. Um, and this is um, thanks to Dr. Monahan for, for providing me to, with these images. Um, 
you know, these effective molecules really do play, must play a large role in, in the host parasite relationship. And the, and the question is to what degree and how are they driving resistance versus susceptibility. Interestingly, also, um, it appears that the salmon louse changes its transcriptome and its, and its uh, feeding response depending on the host species. So that kind of indicates that it's able to detect and sense which host it's feeding on um, and act accordingly, which is really interesting. The question is, does louse virulence drive or contribute to susceptibility? And that's one of the main overarching questions um, that remains to be uh, that remains to be answered. So investigating the function of these different virulence factors um, is a real big emphasis, key objective of, of many different labs, um, you know, in Norway, here in Canada, in the UK, because these potentially um, are excellent candidates for vaccines. Um, also understanding how they impact salmon immunity and how they might differentially impact resistance versus susceptible species um, is a you know really a key area of research. So you know concordant efforts to identify the proteins in the secretome um, across time and space have been conducted, and, and we have about 80 plus proteins that are present, and they share homology with other virulence factors of terrestrial parasites. They're overexpressed. They're localized to the gut, like I showed in the in the previous slide. They're under relaxed evolutionary constraints, so there's there's more they're more prone to adaptation and evolution. Um, which is kind of a key feature of, of virulence factors. There's also some interesting domains that are present. Um, one particular design, domain I'd like to pr uh, draw your attention to, to is these scallop toxins. Um, this is in a stasin domain, and here I'm showing the, um, the transcriptomic response of 12 different isoforms of this scallop toxin, which is a toxin found in centipedes and spiders and scorpions. Um, this is in the transcriptome of Lepiaptera salmonis exposed to co uh, that is attached to coho salmon. So you know, really interesting um, the the toxins that are also present in in the response of salmon lice. You know, one key way that we can look at um, identifying the potential function of these viral factors is using knockdown, and this has been you know pioneered the University of Bergen and and in Norway, and and we're doing a lot of this work also in Canada now, looking at knocking down genes and seeing how, you know, what the function is. And we've done, we've, we've um, performed these studies on some key virus factors. The work is ongoing. Earlier work showed a potential inhibition of blood feeding. So, you know, we're doing more of that, trying to repeat the data and look at, at an understanding the function of those genes. Um, and, and another kind of key piece is understanding the evolution of virulence on farms. There's some work showing that virulence might be exasperated in um, farming situations where there's more hosts and lots of parasites. So that's something that we're also, um, that is on work ongoing and, and hopefully in May we'll have some data to show you. So keeping on the same theme is understanding that the virulence network um, between salmon, lice and their host. And, and applying an interactomics approach um, is a really interesting and kind of novel way of doing things and it has been used really successfully with a number of pathogens in terrestrial agriculture, um, as well as human medicine, um, using protein-protein interaction networks. Um, because if you identify proteins in the pathogen that um, interact with many, many different proteins in the host, those are hubs, and those are excellent vaccine targets, because if you knock down that function, then you impact the relationship on all the host proteins. Um, and we've been using this approach with uh, the interactome for salmon lice. Um, and one particular uh, gene that we found, trypsin-1c, actually has 40% similarity with hypodermin B um, in bot flies. And this inactivates host complement, actually. And it turns out, and this is the putative interactome showing you the pink uh, proteins from the salmon lice and the purple proteins from the salmon, and this the, all the yellow highlighted um, proteins are putatively impacted by the single trypsin 1C. And, and, and interestingly enough, in coho salmon, the uh, complement is, is one of those pathways that is exasperated and an aggressive complement um, response in, in coho fin, but in Atlantic salmon, it's suppressed. So, you know, using this type of approach gives you clues to, to then probe in further. And then this is, this is the 3D rendition of the 
protein based on the, the sequence obtained by sequencing by mass spec. So, um, you know, and, and, and an, an important point is that using the, the viral factors as key, as key vaccine targets, that, that's currently uh, the focus of one fairly large research initiative uh, with uh, Sean Monahan and others in the University of Sterling where they're using viral factors as targets for potential mucosal vaccines. So I, I do hope that we get to hear some of that data next year, but really applying these different approaches and omics approaches to understanding the interactions now, not just between the parasite and the host, like in the skin, but the molecular interactions that are occurring between the different proteins and the virulence factors is, is really going to shed light on the mechanisms of resistance and susceptibility. The main goal for understanding um, the host parasite relationship is to facilitate the development of novel con control strategies. And here are a few key areas of work that are either underway or that I see as a, a focus for future work to enable this goal. Firstly, is the functional characterization of, lamp, of salmon lice virulence factors. This will allow us to understand protein interactions occurring in the skin and how they might be useful for prophylactic approaches. Secondly, an important piece that needs to be elucidated is the contribution of virulence to host susceptibility and we are currently involved in some research hoping to generate answers to this question, but really it boils down to is the host preventing virulence from occurring or is the host simply able to resist the impacts? And finally, how do we elicit a rejection response in susceptible hosts? This final point is where we see translational research come to fruition. Um, and I imagine it's on the forefront of everyone's mind on this call. And this, you know, could involve advances in vaccinology, um, or precision mutagenesis. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I really enjoyed resuming the sea lice conversation and I hope to see y'all uh, in May, 2022 at the sea lice conference in the Faroe Islands. I look forward to any questions that you may have and have a great day. Bye. captivating presentation and we'll also look forward to seeing you here in Torshan next year. Um, dear viewers, don't forget to submit your questions um, and feel free to vote on questions that you find interesting or you'd like to hear an answer to. Um, if you could also address the question to the presenter, that would help us figure out who you're actually asking. Um, and now we'll be hearing from Dr. Gondra Noria who will be speaking about empirical investigation of pelagic sea lice. Dr. Anoria has studied sea lice distribution around the Faroe Islands for many years. She was an early adopter and helped refine plank controlling as a sea lice um, surveying tool. This has yielded much new knowledge about the sea lice in our oceans. Dr. Anoria studied biology at the University of the Faroe Islands and at the University of Aarhus in Denmark. After completing her PhD in marine ecology in 2011, she started working at Fiskerling as a researcher. Today, she's head of the ecology department at Fiskerling, uh, which is the apartment that I'm in. Uh, so take it away, Dr. Anoira. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about investigations of sea lice larvae while they are still free living in the sea. Since it's the copepidides that infect the salmon, one might expect that there are numbers of in situ observations, but actually the number of scientific papers is quite low. Today they are collected with plankton nets and identified taxonomically in the microscopes, and they must be found amongst all the other animals, and this is really time consuming. So most studies are conducted with horizontal surface toes, as the investigations from uh, sentinel cages have shown that uh, they're most abundant in the surface. And there are also some uh, studies with vertical toes at fish farms. So even though there are a few studies, the geographical coverage is quite good. Nelson has uh, made a literature review and commonly for all the papers is that the abundance is quite low and that is higher at the fish farm than at the reference stations. So the general findings are low densities, but also that they are very patchy. 
So most samples have uh, quite a few larvae and uh, there are some extremes with really, really high abundance. So Napoli are dominant at farms and copepodites are the dominant development stage away from fish farms. And the highest densities are found at farm and it, and it de decreases with distance to the farm. A really nice example is from Nelson who has uh, collected quite a lot of samples and an average is a, the, this, the now play decrease steadily with distance to, th to the farm. And also in the Faroe Islands we have made such investigations. Upstream the farm there are very few now play and also a few copepidites but downstream the now play concentration is much higher and there are no copepidites maybe because they have found a host. So, so some studies have found that uh, the densities of copepidites might be highest in shallow estuarine areas and narrow streets. And also they are cl highest close to the shore. And uh, for example, McKippen and Hay, they found extremely high densities when they were wading along the shore instead of taking samples from the, from the boat. And then Costello has uh, speculated in a review that, that there may be some mechanism that transports the copepidides cop cop towards the shore, where they have a higher chance to intercept with wild salmonids. We have also found that uh, the wind might influence the, dis the distribution of salmon lice, as they are more abundant on the eastern side when the wind came from the west and vice versa. So we also demonstrated that the nuclear production can be calculated from in, in situ measurements at fish farms. From the depth distribution of nauplia, which is dependent on the amount of, on where the fish is situated in the water column and the amount of gravid female on the fish, and also the relation between the current speed and the nauplia abundance, we estimated the nauplia production and it was within the range that is found in laboratory experiments. So in the Faroe Islands, we have investigated planktonic seed lice since 2013. And until now, we have done more than 500 surface toes in various fjords and also in straits. And the general finding is the same as in other studies, that there, the mean abundance is low, and there are a few samples with quite high abundances. In all the samples, we have only found 10 pre-adult or adult salmon lice, and 25 caligus. When we take sample in areas with no fish farming, we don't find many salmon lice, but the caligus are quite abundant. And at fish farms, the, the pattern is the same as in other studies, where we find uh, most nauplia, and away from the farm, we mostly find copepidites. If we take all the samples and look at the seasonal variation, we find that the planktonic salmon, salmon abundance, that the planktonic salmon lies abundance resembles the abundance on the fish. They are present throughout the year and maybe even more lice are present during winter. But the uh, planktonic caligos, they show a really clear seasonal pattern where they are highly abundant in autumn and winter and they're practically absent during summer. So we have investigated uh, salmon, planktonic salmon lice during two production cycle in Sundalaya and we found found that uh, the salmon lice distribution was quite similar to what the uh, abundance was on the fish. So during following, there were, on, there were only a few salmon lice in the water, or sometimes none. And uh, during the production si cycle, the number increased steadily. For the calicles, we found uh, seasonal patterns. They were present in the winter of 14, 16, and 17. But in the winter 15, there were no calicles. When we look at the f uh, salmon lice on the fish, 
we find a similar pattern in 14 to 16, but in 17, there were no lice on the fish, even though there were plenty of them in the sea. This is probably due to um, delousing activity. If we look at the spatial distribution, we actually find that the amount of uh, sea lice increases with distance to the farm. And this is because the amount of the copepidides increase steadily with distance. And uh, we actually found highest abundance at the station which was furthest away from the farm. And this might be attributed to the currents in the area. At the fish farm, the currents are generally towards the south, while in the southern part of the area, the currents recirculate the water and keeping it there. Um, but these same observations, they, can also, they also resemble the observation from Scotland because further south, it is uh, more shallow and narrow, and we find a copepod aggregation there. So another case study was in Servosfjöre, which we con for conducted for the fish farming company. The outer part of the farm was located in the area where currents were uh, dominated by tidal currents and the water circulation was quite high, while the inner part of the farm was in the estuarine area. Uh, so they had a really uh, uh, severe problem with sea lice because the infection came really early in the production cycle and is very quickly involved into self-infection. So in this study, we took plankton toes along the shore and also perpendicular to the shores and also in open water and at the river mouth at the base of the fjord. As presented earlier, previous studies have indicated higher densities towards the shore, and when comparing the samples marked with circles, we find similar patterns. In the open water, sea lice were observed in more than half of the samples, but the densities were quite low, especially if we compare them to the density along the shore. And in the samples taken outwards from, from the shore, we find something in intermediate. The nauplia density was comparable to the open water densities, while the copepidite densities was comparable to the shoreline service. So in the estuarine part of the fjord, the salmon larva distribution was quite comparable to previous finding. So the current knowledge on the depth distribution of sea lice is used in many prevention methods where the fish are kept out of the water surface since the salmon lice are most abundant there. And also the depth distribution is quite important when modeling the distribution of sea lice. So in January, we conducted trials to investigate the depth distribution and uh, we used a high volume pump for sampling. So the sample volume was similar to the surface toes. And we investigated two stations at six, six occasions. So altogether we have 12 samples for each depth. There was some variation between the individual samples and they did not always show a clear depth uh, distribution, but in average, it was quite clear that the salmon lice copepidides were most abundant in the surface and they, the abundance decreased towards the depth, towards the bottom. And uh, at 40 meters depth, there were still salmon lice copepidides present. The Caligos um, elongatus did show a reverse pattern as they were most abundant at the deepest uh, sampling stations. So. These uh, studies, they indicate that it might be a good, ide good idea to uh, try to keep the fish out of the surface waters to prevent salmon lice infections. But on the other hand, maybe you can get a problem with the caligus lice instead. So 
There are very few studies on sea lice in their planktonic stage, and this is probably because it's too challenging with today's methods. So most knowledge is based on laboratory studies and sentinel cages. And um, in nature, there are several factors such as temperature, salinity, light, and stratification and mixing that are affecting the sea lice simultaneously. And it's not easy to know which of these traits are decisive when mixed together. So in my opinion, it would be highly valuable to have more in situ observations where all these factors are in game. However, in order for this research to expand, there are new methods needed. And luckily there is currently research on this. One example is the work by Thompson with fluorescent light, where the salmon lights illuminate, making them easier to find amongst all the other zooplankton. So hopefully there will be more studies in the future. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much for the final presentation, uh, Dr. Nora. So that brings us to the end of this first session, um, which just to remind you was host and parasite uh, biology, keys for control. And uh, yeah, we had the pleasure of listening to four very interesting presentations that each address that topic in their own unique and important way. Um, so I'd like to once again extend a, a big thank you to each of our presenters, um, Dr. Bricknell, Dr. Sturm, uh, Dr. Braden, and, and finally, Dr. Anora. Um, hopefully we now have our presenters with us live. Um, they are ready to take questions and comments from you. Uh, but also, hopefully, we'll be able to um, get a bit of a discussion going um, so that uh, we can discuss the questions, even though they might be aimed at just one presenter. The uh, first question um, is for uh, Ian. And it's about vaccine, and they ask uh, which types of modes or models have been tried by your group? Um, when you say models, do you mean routes of injection uh, for the vaccines or for um, the challenge methods? So we, we've done several challenge methods. We've used adult challenges and calamus challenges looking for um, reduction in settlement of the calamuses and failure of the calamuses to go from calamus one, calamus two, and to pre-adult. And in, in all of those cases, we delivered the vaccine into peritoneally. Um, and that's a, an interesting um, a point in itself because we're thinking about the um, interface between the parasite and the integument. So vaccinating um, intraperitoneally may not be triggering very strong mucosal responses such as IgT. Um, so uh, in the challenges we tried, um, especially for the vaccine in the patent, that was intraperitoneal, uh, followed by uh, looking at the uh, settlement success, the survival of the calamus, and ultimately the survival of the pre-adults and adults. Um, and we saw most of the impact of, of that on the calamus survival. I hope that answers that question. Yep, thank you very much. Um, and we'll follow up with a, another question for Ian uh, in the interest of your, your own time. Um, firstly, it's a compliment on a beautiful presentation. Unfortunately, it's it's uh, anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> Could be much worse if it's anonymous. I like but, that um, like already, ask, um, <laughs> <laughs> In your experience, um, which should be the best candidate protein for producing a, a lice vaccine? Well, that that's a difficult one. I, I think the best candidate proteins come from the calamus, but we tested 11 potential candidates in, in our vaccine trials, and they all performed to a greater or less extent. Originally, when I was doing this work with, with, with Jess Pease, who um, was my postdoc at the time, we identified close on 30 or 40 potential proteins. We couldn't take them all to trial. So 
the ones we chose had, had previously been trialed in other parasite, uh, it's a parasite vaccines, and they're detailed uh, in the patent. Um, but there are another 20 or 30 that are, are certainly worth uh, looking at, and we hope to look at some of those in, in future. And of course, this also goes out to my area of expertise. We looked at it from a proteinomics uh, point of view. We had some work done on, um, load it off, and then we reverse engineered the sequence to make the peptide for the vaccine. Um, you, there's plenty of uh, potential candidates. And of course, identifying those protective sequences is, is going to be a challenge. But I think it will be one of these ones that we identify that turns off that neutrophil response in the fish. And if we can reinstate that, then I think we'll see a really good sea lice vaccine, which is probably, when I, when I say good for an ectoparasite vaccine, I'm thinking of something that will give 50 or 60% reduction in calamus settlement. I don't think we're ever going to get a vaccine that's as good as the, the COVID-19 vaccines that we have with certainly 95% uh, plus protection against the original strain. And um, we're not going to see the things that we have with Aramona salmonicida, where we regularly get 90% uh, protection in those fish. But certainly an integrated program of, of sea lice management, I think vaccines have, have got an important role to play. And they'll, they'll, they'll be in a more important role as we start to understand that host parasite interaction more. It would be really nice if we could get a 95% effective vaccine, I'd have to say. I would retire, go order my Bentley. <laughs> <laughs> You're pretty great. Um, uh, I think that's it for questions for you. So if you want to run, you can do, but you can also I, stay in. I've got another 10 or 15 minutes before I have to go and uh, cool. teach some students on the uh, scientific process. Could nice. be exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so yeah. please, if you want to chip in on some of the other questions, you're welcome to. Um, as for the rest of you as well, if uh, if you had any comments on the questions for Ian, uh, please uh, speak up. <laughs> um, but anyway, I can go on to the next question, which is for, for um, Armin. Um, the question is, is it likely that resistance will develop towards mechanical treatments? Thank you. That's a that's a very uh, good and interesting question. Um, that we uh, a lot of people are wondering. Um, let's say the the difference between drugs and the non medicinal uh, treatments is that the the drugs usually have a very specific target, and therefore resistance is um, often monogenic. So there's only um, the requirement for one gene to mutate to uh, kind of block the efficacy of a drug, whereas with the um, parameters that affect the response to the non-medicinal treatments, it's often more complicated than that. But in principle, we need to uh, be prepared that resistance could potentially develop also because some of the um, treatments um, use factors that uh, vary in the environment, such as temperature or salinity. So therefore, it's conceivable um, that resistance could develop, but it might be more difficult for the parasites to develop resistance if it is um, a response that involves many genes. Okay, thank you for that answer. Um, if I could chip in, do you think that the hydrolyzers and thermalizers lysis, you'll select for temperature and freshwater resistant strains? Um, I think uh, that, that uh, to answer the second um, part of your question first, I mean, the temperature shock that is provided in these um, uh, devices is uh, more extreme than what you would get in, in, the, in the field. But at the same time, you, you do have a range of um, repair mechanisms and uh, also mechanisms that, uh, and it has been shown in, in the literature by recent work uh, that um, by different groups that uh, uh, a pre-exposure to, to heat shock uh, can actually uh, modify the responses. Uh, that, that, that's a uh, group by um, a paper from 
uh, uh, Nielsen's group um, uh, by author called uh, Borchel, who, who show that if you pre-expose the, the sea lice to a heat shock, then uh, you modify the responses in the second uh, one. So uh, I think it, it's conceivable that environmental factors uh, uh, affect that and that certain genotypes are more um, pre-adapted to um, it, it may not be a, a, a heat responsive uh, like a heat tolerant per se but they might have better response to to the treatments mm. Mm. yeah I, I was just thinking of the peroxide story when um peroxide arrived i remember a colleague of me of mine saying i i can't see how resistance would develop to that because it was swamping the catalyzer and superoxide this those pathways and hey presto now we see lice that are more peroxide tolerant than we did 20 years ago so resistant aren't they <laughs> uh interesting discussion um so we have a, another question for oh yes we do we have another question for for armin um so uh the question is from rolando uh, and he asks, is there a recommended frequency of drug rotation to delay antiparasitic resistance? Um, I think this, this depends on, on the context. Uh, I think for, if we look at, at Lepiofter Salmonis in the North Atlantic, uh, the level of resistance is, is probably too high for most of the um, drugs. So uh, a lot of the things that I said in my talk uh, and I should have been maybe a bit more specific here um, about the rotational methods. They won't work only if you apply them early on. And um, what we see currently is um, for, for most of the resistance genes, the, the levels, are, they're too frequent in the population. Um, is there a, a certain way to rotate? I think that, that question is still unanswered for, for sea lions. So uh, I think um, nobody can actually answer that question. Um, so what you, you would like to achieve with the rotation is to have a scenario where uh, any individual that carries a resistance gene will then be hit by, by another drug. Uh, so because if you assume that the resistance genes are initially quite rare in the population, then it's quite unlikely for one individual to have uh, two different resistance genes. And, uh, the rotational strategy should therefore make sure that either within the same generation or within the next generation, uh, those carriers of the resistance genes will be um, confronted with another drug. Um, and if you can that achieve that, uh, then, then that's fine. But it depends on the generation span, on the dispersal rate, and on the specifics uh, also spatially uh, of, uh, of the host populations. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and um, Laura, we, we have a question for you, which is, um, have you seen a regulatory T cell response in the attachment site or during wound healing of lice infestations? Okay, well, that's a great question. First of all, thanks um, for having me here. It's nice to see you all. This has been one of the most challenging things, I think, trying to make it a virtual presentation. <laughs> um, um, and yes, I'm from Canada. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm assuming this is with respect to the coho response. Um, and, and actually, we do not. Uh, the, the regulatory T-cell response um, is associated with the control fin in coho. Um, and in fact, the CD8 T-cell response is the, is the uh, signature that we observe. So we do not see a regulatory T-cell response until the calamus are well and uh, until the, the lice are well rejected. Thank you. And um, another question. Uh, it's it's really interesting to see the use of transcriptomics in um, in addressing this problem. Uh, is it a challenge with respect to the how how uh, well annotated the databases are for that? Is that something that I mean? You mentioned uh, a lot of international collaboration working on similar things. Is is that something that's that's limiting, or or is are there projects working towards addressing that? Yeah, no, I, and that's a really great, great question. Um, maybe in the past, I think that's been one of our, our limiting factors. 
Um, and you hit the nail on the head there with multiple labs looking, you know, at annotating genes, the, the salmon louse genes as they're being um, discovered and annotated properly and, and, and also from the host perspective. Um, but I think the international kind of, especially with the new ensemble, um, you know, uh, consortiums um, and efforts to kind of standardize that have largely facilitated kind of getting, you know, the baseline settled in terms of transcriptomic annotations. So that's definitely improving, um, but there is still much work to do in that in that space. Um, and as we, you know, as multiple efforts uh, globally, um, trying to with all these different projects, parallel projects kind of going on, hopefully that will fill in the gaps. Um, and as we fill in the gaps, you know, from 10 years ago to now, we've been able to, especially with proteomics, at the, you know, initially we were just looking at unidentified, unidentified proteins one, two, and three, and now we know that you know there are trypsins and caseps. As that goes forward, um, we'll be able to fill in those blanks even more and more. So it's it'll be interesting to see how how that story fills out in the next couple of years. But um, very interesting and good question. Yeah, absolutely, it's a, it's a fascinating area indeed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Um, so I have a question for Gunvor. Um, it is. Um, could fluorescence facilitate rapid sample processing, perhaps using image recognition or AI detecting lice in real time? Um, the real time part of this method is quite challenging because uh, these uh, uh, nuclei and the copepidides have been uh, conserved in formalin for, in order for them to um, to enlight up, but. Uh, Refining the sampling methods and, and trying to to uh, take all the other plankton kind of by size fraction or something and just having these uh, samples with the lice on, then it, it's definitely a possibility with the uh, uh, yeah imagination imagine yeah it would be uh, be really handy to be able to do things really quickly. <laughs> Definitely, because that is the major obstacle for this line of research. Yeah. Um, there's another question for you. Um, they ask, is there a simpler method to quantify sea lice larvae? A simpler method? Uh, yeah, all the other methods that have been used uh, for now are actually simpler, maybe. They use sentinel cages and they count, uh, look at uh, how, how lice are infecting the fish and so on. And also uh, people are now working with uh, uh, PCR and such things to, to kind of try to quantify in, in the water. But that work, uh, it's, it's not been so su successful yet. And, and there is this uh, obstacle that you don't, uh, you can't uh, distinguish between nauplia and copepidides. Oh, when you're looking at DNA. Yeah, if you're looking at DNA, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that would make it harder. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Yes, I'm, uh, I'm afraid we actually have to uh, put a stop to this very interesting uh, Q&A session in the interest of time. So um, I'd like to thank all the participants for their questions and comments, and also once again extend our gratitude to the presenters. Uh, and all of those who have participated uh, online with us today. And uh, we thank you again for your engagement and your comments and uh, thoughts that you shared with us. Yeah, thank you very much. It was really interesting. Um, before we go on to the next item on our agenda, uh, the CLIS conference would like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank our sponsors. This conference would not be possible uh, without their support and sponsorship. So first, the company is sponsoring the 10-minute presentations. That's uh, Benchmark Animal Health and, uh, and Hidden Fjord. And then the company is sponsoring five-minute presentations, um, which is Bacafrost and Elanco Animal Health. And then to the other sponsors of this conference. Oh. Maui, don't forget Maui. Yeah, which is Maui. <laughs> and um, the, um, yeah, Torshaun Komuna, which is the uh, Torshaun Council, the municipality of Torshaun. 
and finally to uh, Torshald Kveld School, which is the evening school here in Torshal. So today our sponsored presentation is from um, Backerfrost. We will see a short film now, I think. Any second. Any second now. <laughs> But yes, while, while we're waiting, of course, I, we hope... <laughs> my name is Marner Nolze. I'm a veterinarian working at Backerfrost, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the Backerfrost approach to sea lice management here in the Faroe Islands. Our main focus point as a company, how to manage sea lice situation here in the Faroe Islands, is firstly to increase the average molt waste to reduce the production time at sea, thereby reducing the time at sea where the fish can be exposed for sea lice infestations, and to increase the preventive period where we have no lice on the fish. This is mainly done by preventive measures such as skirts, use of cleaner fish, preventive in-feed treatments, and finding the right loca location for cages in the fjord. To reduce the overall lice pressure, it is very important that we have effective treatment system in place and that we have enough of capacity to treat fish and to have access to this treatment system when you need it. We try as far as possible not to use any medical treatments in reducing overall lice pressure. In recent years, there has been a transition from the use of medical treatments towards the use of non-medical uh, treatment methods at Bacafrost. Bacafrost has not been using any medical bad treatments in a period for three consecutive years. We believe that medical bad treatment should be withheld to absolute critical cases as a last option and not as a part of the general treatment strategy. This to preserve the effect of the active substances in the medicine and to minimize our environmental impacts on the fjords. When treatment is necessary, treatment of choice has been non-medical methods. The latest mechanical treatment delousing system that Backerfrost obtained has obtained is the FLS system, um, which is installed on one of the company's own uh, service vessel in the Faroe Islands. The SFI system, flushing system, has also been used but it's not available now. Um, Bacherfrost has two service vessels that are equipped with non-medical treatment system for delicing. Both these systems or vessels have the optolyzer system installed for warm water treatments. And one has in addition the FLS system installed. The treatment capacity is quite good. Last year, these ship treated over 160,000 tons of fish. We find it is important that the company has ownership of these treatment vessels and have to have immediate access to these treatment options and also to have full control over biosecurity measures uh, during treatment and during transport between sites. Um, in 2022, Baca Frost will upscale the freshwater treatment capacity with a new well boat adding further to the company's treatments options. The legislative uh, lice limits in the Faroe Islands has gradually been reduced over the last year. Average lice numbers per fish in Bacafra stock had also, has, has also been gradually declining over the last year. Also over a period where the number of fish has increased. There are some fluctuations in the average lice numbers over years, but the overall trend is that the lice numbers are steadily declining. Um, a crucial precondition for this course is shortening the production time at sea by increasing the smalt weight. The Backerfrost large smalt strategy is to increase average smalt weight that are stocked at all Backerfrost sites to 500 grams and to reduce the production times at sea to 10 to 12 months. This year, the goal is to reach 400 grams, and next year, hopefully, we will reach 500 grams. 
So our priority is going forward. We want to work closely with the research environment to help us understand different key areas of sea lice biology and epidemiology uh, and to find the best practice for controlling sea lice infestation. So we are very open to uh, relevant research projects and are also active partners in different ongoing projects. For Bacafros, it's important to be one step ahead of the lice problems all the time. We continue, continuously try to find um, the most sustainable long-term solutions uh, to tackle the sea lice situation. Uh, our main point as a company on how to manage sea lice uh, here in the Faroe Islands is, uh, as I mentioned, to increase the preventive period where we have no lice on the fish to reduce the overall lice pressure and to reduce the production time at sea. So the key in sea lice management is being one step ahead all the time. Um, so this was shortly our um, point of view. Thank you very much and hope you got a short insight into our main focus point here in the Faroe Islands. that informative and interesting presentation. On that note, that ends today's agenda. Um, the topic for tomorrow's agenda is environmental impacts and societal responsibility. There will be five new presentations. Yes, so tomorrow we'll have the pleasure to listen to uh, some presentations. I'm going to just give you a, a brief advertisement for those now. So the first one is sea lice and traffic lights. Modeling Sea Louse Dispersion and Infection Risks uh, from uh, Anne Sandvik from the Institute of Marine Research in Norway. Uh, the next presentation will be uh, Aquaculture and Social Science, The Wheel of Sustainability um, by Tonja Osmundsen from NTNU, Social Research in Norway. And then there will be Aquaculture and Wild Fish Interactions, uh, Bengt Finstad from, also from uh, well, from the NTNU Center of Fisheries and Aquaculture in Norway. Then Global and National Governance of Sea Louse Management. Tyler Isaac from the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch. Uh, and then Anti-Parasitic Treatments and Potential Environmental Risks by Philippe Tuca Diaz from the Salmon Technological Institute of Salmon, Chile. Um, so going back to tomorrow's program, uh, in addition to the uh, presentations that Ian uh, has told us about, there will also be a special presentation on sea lice in aquaculture, an overview of glo current global trends. Um, we look forward to seeing you all again tomorrow. Uh, please share the link to this conference around if anyone hasn't heard about it and would like to join us tomorrow. Uh, and also, um, once you've um, seen all of the presentations, or if you're not able to come back tomorrow or the day after, please fill in the poll. Um, it will really help us to um, see how well we've done and what we need to do in the future. Um, thanks for today. We hope to see you again tomorrow. Thank you. See you tomorrow. <laughs>